Hello, welcome to the Creativity Theory Podcast. A uh, few things I want to get out of the way real quick. Um, we've been on a hiatus. I've been on a hiatus. Um, haven't recorded a new podcast in about three, four months. And uh, rearranged some things. Those of you who are watching video rather than audio, um, you can see this rearrangement of the set. Also, there may be some rearrangings in how I edit these things. Um, and there may be a rearranging in <clears throat> how frequently I release episodes. My goal is to release them as frequently as I can muster. So this may be along the lines of once per week as it's usually been. This may be less frequent than that. Maybe something like once a month or once every other month. It might be more than once a week. I don't know. I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, anyway, so sorry for those of you that were not happy about the break. And uh, well, anyway, let's get into it. Maybe I'll just cut all that out. You had to upgrade, man. That's all yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. That's also, all it is. They appreciate that. They mm -hmm. got to appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Also, yeah. this one's going to be a big bummer, I know, but no, no ads. At least I, not, there won't be an ad every episode, but sometimes on, there will be hold an on, ad. Hold on. But like... I got to see like three fire ads the last few episodes. I don't get an ad. That's how, black man can't get an ad. <laughs> black man black, what kind of world is a brother can't get an ad? <laughs> I want to support Tootsie Rolls too. Oh well, yeah, now I feel extra racist for not doing the ad. <laughs> black man. Well, all right. Let's let's. Nobody put wanted to advertise on this hour of time. That's. What <laughs> I didn't want to say it. But every company I talked to, yeah, when I brought up this is a guest of color, they said, mm. Mm. <laughs> "Let me know about the next episode." <laughs> they gave you a chart. They gave you like a color chart of like who can get on and who can't. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, well, how have you been? By the way, my guest today uh, is Cordero <laughs> Wilson. <laughs> Sorry, it's been so long. I don't know how to do a podcast. My guest today. I don't get no ads. Yeah. I don't get no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I don't have a computer in front of me to, with questions prepared. <laughs> At least I'm being insulted in a nice chair. Yeah. This is a very yes. comfortable chair. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing a brother can get, and that is a nice a red chair. Nice <laughs> <laughs> and it reclines. It does. We can you know what's funny? Back. It was funny because, like, I, I've known you for a long time. Mm -hmm. I've known you for a very long time. And you're very, like, serious and sincere, but sometimes you also can live in a bit. So when you mm. told me, because, like, there's no switch on these things. When you told me just lean back, there was a split second. I was like, is he just, like, fucking with me? <laughs> <laughs> he just has me, like, in, <laughs> in, like, Maxwell stance. And then I was waiting for the moment for you to be like, nah, that shit doesn't move. I'm sorry. I'm fucking with <laughs> you. But then I actually went back, and these are... Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. It's a nice way to do it. Mm. Well, okay. So Cordero and I met doing comedy roughly 10 years ago, as most of the friends I know in this comedy scene. And um, we've worked together a number of times on some little short films or sketches. And then, of course, the big five hour movie, Cordero had a big role in that. Mm -hmm. And um, we've collaborated on music a number of times you're always fun to you're actually you know i find it hard for me to do creative collaborations and you're one of the few people with music i've been able to do it in this very fun fluid way and that's i definitely want to get into talking about like kind of the yeah. process we've had for different songs because that, that would be fun um but one thing to note is Cordero was 2018 when you moved to New York. Yes. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, about five years ago, Cordero left Wilmington. He left the nest to go pursue comedy in New York. And, um, well, how's that been going? Uh, it's been good, but it's had, it's like, it's had its fun ups and downs in the ride. Um, and, learning what i've learned while i've been there i realize that that's just part of it mm -hmm. um like you're there you're experiencing it you're having fun i had like a really fun time the first two years like i was just out every night going out doing comedy and then like height of pandemic everything shut down and that was like it was interesting because it was like i know you for 10 years we primarily did comedy yes we did the music and stuff but i would always see you at the club so like that was my focus for like a very long time and that focus just like 
stopped randomly. And it was mm-hmm. a weird because it was like one of those outside forces that mm-hmm. was just like it wasn't me being like giving up. It was right. just like, a, oh, I want to go do the thing. And the thing's not there anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and then watching it like outside shows becoming a thing and people doing their own like having these own little avenues for creativity. Um, it was nice. It was really nice. And then as things rebuilt, I started putting it in this cool space where I'm also like, I'm doing stand up, but then all this like production stuff I've been working on. It's been like fun. Mm. Um, what kind of production stuff? Uh, so I, I, I also produce and like um, co-host a podcast, mm-hmm. a Negro Jump podcast. I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's funny. I do this thing now where I, uh, I do like to, uh, as I'm going up on stage or if I'm walking up, They'll, you know, ask you what credit would you want, you know, and I'll do, oh, you know, it's from New York or, you know, whatever. But then I always like to add Negro Jump podcast and I'll say it to a white host. Yeah. And I'll give them the option. Like you can, I'm letting you say it. Just say it if you want to, like as it, as it comes up and depending on whether they say it or not, I always have something to like lead into because it's like, mm-hmm. If I gave him the pass and he says it, then I'll like low key roast him for like five seconds. But right. <laughs> it's just part of it. Uh, but yeah, you can say it. We if they um, don't say it, then you'll like make if fun you don't, of being a pussy. For being a little bitch. Yeah. If you fucking bitch can't say Negro one time, you can't say, like, do your job. Let people know where they can find me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my fault my voice is going a little bit I've been um, on the road as well with um, Wills Maxwell's uh, Black Power Rangers tour Mm. um, which brought me here to Wilmington I usually come see you like you know once a year Mm -hmm. twice a year like I always got to reconnect and it lined up with this tour but we've been we've been on the road for a few days so um, my apologies if my voice is a little like cracky but um, uh, we've been doing that podcast as well as doing comedy it's another comedian um Gerard Fortune who's another good friend of yours mm-hmm. you'll see um and doing both of those together has just been fun like realizing that um creating art whether it be through like you know performing stand up or through like mediums like this it's just like it's a cool chill chill mm-hmm. which i think we do well like that creative space that's yeah. where i like to live in like that creation space whether it be creating a joke yes or like a thing or like something like that it is yeah it is fun i feel like i mean across the three mediums i mostly focus on comedy music and film i feel like we've been able to work together quite nice i mean stand up it's not like we necessarily have gotten on stage at the same time <laughs> yeah, <laughs> time yeah. Together, but um you know like uh, i think we we get each other's humor in a way to where like we both we don't have the same sense of humor, but we both appreciate each other's sense of humor. And I, I remember one of my favorite things, I, I barely have ever given anyone like a tag or a note for a joke, but I remember that one joke that you used to tell about, you can tell how racist a white guy is by the way he says black guy or whatever. Okay. Like <laughs> he's like black guy. And then I was like, I was like, what, what if you just add on there, but you can tell he's really racist, if, racist. If he goes, oh, black guy. <laughs> 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 and then you told me like, maybe like months later, like I was doing a show in Raleigh and I tried that out. It crushed. I was like, fuck yes. <laughs> it's like it's fucking Scooby-Doo level of, uh, yeah. Black guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, okay. So, would you, would you rather talk about music first, or you want to talk about uh, sketches and, and movie? Um, let's get on. Let's get on a music tip because music's. Um, I feel like that might have been my. So the thing I like about doing projects with you is that like it's almost like this weird open space to just be like which is mm. which is cool because normally i'm just kind of like standoffish i don't really it's not that i don't like working with people i just I always have this weird feeling of like i don't know if this person knows what they're doing and every, mm-hmm, <laughs> but mm-hmm. every time like you're out you're like we've shot films and stuff before like you seem to be on it so i know you rapped um i know you've had comedians on like even before you had me on, like you had comedians and people and then you knew i did um jokes that have singing like, yes. singing in yes. them yes there's jokes that you would do or you would sing for just a little bit i was like damn he's got like a voice and like soul and like that would be amazing to to incorporate that in music and i mean definitely i feel like i've really aimed with each of our collaborations to highlight that yeah that like mm, creamy voice or whatever. yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got a creamy Cause voice because you, you'll do that you'll do the like you'll do uh because you'll layer some shit you'll be like you'll do it like this and do it like this mm-hmm. and and 
music, like singing and music is like been around in my family, but it wasn't my focus. Like it was something like my mother did and things like that. So it was cool. I think whenever you approached me about being like, yeah, do you want to be on? I can't remember the first album. So it was, I had you on CGM and that's what I don't was. even feel like it was like an official thing. It was, I think it was just kind of like you and I talked about hanging out and maybe listening to some beats, kind of like a free form thing. And I had just moved in to that new apartment yeah. with that room at that girl, Mandy. Mm -hmm. And I still had like boxes and shit in my room. And you just came in there. I had like just set my computer up and it was just like a mess all around. We were just sitting there and I was playing beats, playing beats. And then you were just kind of like humming things and you hummed something that to me sounded like "Fight at you." <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't what you said, but that's what I heard, and I just started laughing so hard because it was this like, I think it was the exact beat we ended up using, but yeah. it was that sort of like smooth R and B feel. And then it was like, "I want to fight at you with you." It's like what, <laughs> what an activity! <laughs> and it was right around the time of that like Charlottesville thing, so it was kind of yeah. like, "Yeah, this is this is something in the satirical." sphere to to mess with and it was just one of the, we came up with this song that like in terms of sonically it sounds very pleasant yeah but the the actual content the, the of the content lyrics is extremely, extremely rough extremely wild. <laughs> right i've always thought about that i was like if i ever make anything like this song will cancel me <laughs> <laughs> exactly. oh, yeah. and that is one of many things that i'm like this is this is one of the four horsemen of my apocalypse yes yes yes, yes. yeah there are like every time we meet i do something like so offensive that will like one day get me but it's it's that fun that's the thing mm. about it is you you create this like space where for me musically uh one I like you actually do production. So like I'm always been around people who like oh let's write or like you know get these poems or whatever the thing mm. is going. Um but then there was no place to like facilitate it and house it. And so when you like reached out or we started hanging out, you were like I already have the setup to do it. I know how to press it. I know how to, you know, mix mm. it and everything. So just go in and try some stuff out. And then, yeah, we actually got that, like, it, it, they became these, like, studio sessions, which was cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, and then it was just, like, anytime, I always had it in the back of my head, it was, like, anytime he makes an album or something, I'm like, yo, let me get, like, one track. Mm -hmm. let me, Because that, that's just, like, a fun, fun thing. Um, with you, I, we've probably talked about it, but, like, what was it that got you into act, like, um, into rapping? Like that crazy. It was a sketch. So I was doing sketch com before I even started doing stand up. Like when I was 11, I started making funny videos with my friends. Yeah. And then it became more sketch comedy as I went like into middle school and high school. It was a lot of just like sketches with the brothers, you know? And um, I would play characters. And I just came up with this rap character, Camboy Smith. And the whole point of it was for me to be. Um, a white guy doing a black scent and rapping poorly, like being bad at <laughs> rapping. And it, it's more, it's not, it, it was more supposed to be this like jokes on this guy kind of thing. Like this guy just sucks. <laughs> anyway, the whole, the first um, song that I did in this, it was like a, a documentary spotlight of this guy. So it's like interview with him and there's bitches on his side. And, and then it's going in between him and the booth recording. And he's working on his new track, Dim Binary Numbers. And he's just <laughs> rapping in one zero, 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 one. Like, he's rapping like that. And then I just kept making music videos as this character. And this, I did this over summer when I was like 16. So then when I came into like my junior year of high school, and, and like there was people, my, my arc was like, I came in freshman year and I tried to keep my videos and YouTube stuff hidden because I got in big trouble for it in middle school. Mm. And then... Damn, you were posting that early? That's wild. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, middle school, I was making like South Park-esque cartoons, and I got in big trouble Ooh. when the <laughs> teachers found those out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I talked about it on the podcast I did with Wills, uh, because he asked me like a, an origin story, and I felt like the trouble I got in middle school very much, I think, colors my attraction to playing with the line and like offending mm. people or causing trouble. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, so then my sophomore year of high school, I remember the broadcasting teacher caught word that I make videos. And I was not in broadcasting. But like someone said like, "Hey, Miss Stevenson would be interested in you doing like a man on the street segment if you can keep it appropriate." But a bunch of other people in that class have seen your videos and they've been telling her he can't do it. And I was like, "I could do it." And I like talked to her. She's like, "All right, next semester take my class and you'll do it." So then when I started making these man on the street things, then more people in the school were aware I made videos and then started looking at my YouTube stuff. 
in, so I had like some little audience. Mm-hmm. So when I came back my junior year, after I made that sketch, everyone in the hallway was calling me Camboy Smith. So it was just one of these things. It was like a sketch I did that seemed to get a reaction out of people, and people seemed to latch onto this character. And I just kept making songs. I, I, I was very, very musically ungifted <laughs> when I was doing this. And that's that's interesting to me because um, I don't. Maybe that I guess that shows to like what you can do if you're dedicated to something. Mm-hmm. Because I've only watched you like. When I when I first got on to like you rapping, I was like, yeah, he's like being offensive and like making it funny, but like there's bars in there, mm. like there's actually like there's something in there, yeah. Like he understands, yeah, like the flow of it and how it's supposed to go. He can flow, he can get in these pockets, and I'm like, he's actually rapping. It's it's like it's out there shit, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But then I've also seen you like just get better each album, and like those later last three or so albums, I'm like, damn, this thing mm-hmm. is spin bars yeah. right now. Like yeah. he's actually like doing it. So the fact that you're saying you weren't gifted in it, like mm-hmm. I always thought I still you just feel like I am. I really still like feel like I'm musically retarded. Like I, I, <laughs> I, I, I feel like it's a thing. Well, I feel like there's my approach to getting better at it has been. Oh, I've talked about these brain hemispheres all the time, but it, it feel I felt like a very left hemisphere like hard practicing and trying to like grasp kind of thing and then i think a lot of my understanding of the way things work and and deepening my relationship with creativity itself is getting me to understand no to really get good at this there's a a huge element of letting go and Mm. like music is one of the most profoundly connected to this divine harmony that's like at the source of everything in fact you know the music is good when you let go enough to where you're just being like a a, uh, a transmuter of this rhythm, you know what I mean? And, yeah. I, and I definitely. Well, we talked about this like before, uh, like even like what yesterday mm-hmm. about like letting these like energies or thoughts come through and mm-hmm. like like bring them out. So like, do you think that that was just you letting that happen with Camboy, and then it keeps like developing, kind of thing? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've always <laughs> been much more focused on the lyrics and the performance. Yeah. I mean, and I would even say the lyrics more than the performance. Like my whole thing came from I enjoyed writing these bars and these, like I never enjoyed freestyling really. Yeah, and that was one thing I did actually like about working with you is you I, I would get good stuff from you if I just put you in the booth and and just ran it through and just said hey just sing and make shit up. Yeah, and a lot of times I would just cut things that you did first time around together. Like in the, our most recent one that came out, the end of love songs. Um, uh, love you right love you right yeah yeah which was one we tried to make w- during cgm and then i re-dug it back up and yeah we, we the blueberry it. pie and then we i remember just uh in your old pontiac we some some happened about pie and we just kept like blueberry pie banana cream pie american pie <laughs> american pie american good sniper. movie american <laughs> sniper <laughs> yeah um and <clears throat> So yeah, and the the lines there where where one of my favorite parts in the song is when you're like, "What's your email? What's your password? I need the details. How's that ass work? Yeah, like I just make that ass work. <laughs> Give me that homework. I need that classwork. <laughs> Make that ass twerk. Come on, baby, shake them cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the large, like you know, we might have added a little bit. You did. You improvised something where it was most of that, and then I was like, "Yes, do that again." And then we'll add this little bit to like yeah. finish it. So yeah, there there is this nice hybrid between um, my heavy focus and proclivity to write and plan and like construct mm-hmm. and produce something, but then you have this like free form openness to like whatever idea Cameron has, I'm into it and I I want to support it and add to it. Rather than like pitch something that is completely different, you know what I mean. And yeah. it's not that I don't like that ever. It's just that um, I I feel that I'm very much an ideas person, and um, I feel that I have a hard time having collaborating with another person who's like very grounded in the idea that they come to the thing with Mm -hmm. and we're having to figure out how to put the ideas together that's really hard because there has to be a level of understanding of each other on both ends in order to properly 
mesh those things together where yeah. it seems more like you don't come in with any sort of agenda. You come in with like this pure openness yeah, and, and you figure out and you adapt to whatever is laid out there in terms of the ideas I'm bringing to the table or the lack of ideas. Yeah. Like, cause there's been plenty of times we've gone in where it's like, I have no ideas. Let's play some beats and see what we have. And then you'll do something again, just kind of mouthing or humming something. And I'd be like, Yes, this is it. Uh huh. And then and, and then, then you'll we'll you'll scroll flower. through and you'll be like, oh, I actually had something that I wrote that I'm like, oh, let me figure out how this can go in there or like this idea. Um, and I I I like that because to say like, um, going back to what I was talking about earlier about how I like art, I love creating, but music was always just like this one thing that was harder for me to to grasp. Like I can go do live performances. Doing film is fine. Like, it's fun. Like, that's almost like live performance because I did, like, theater and stuff. Mm -hmm. Music was, like, it always was something I felt like I was decent at, but it was so personal, and I always, like, didn't know how to facilitate it. So, like, you're already, like, boom, just come hang out. And I'm, like, I'm in a safe space. Let me just say some wild shit. Yeah. Let me just hum some stuff that's been on my brain and see what happens, and then you'll just take it and, like, mm -hmm. go with it. Um and like just rappers I've followed over the years, like, you know, Jay Z and Wayne, they just like, Oh yeah, I'll just go in the booth and like figure stuff out. I don't really write it necessarily, or mm. like watching like behind the scenes stuff and being like, Oh, they, these these songs come from these like hangouts in these uh studio sessions. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, you got three songs, which is like what what we end up doing. And it it just it just works. Like yes. it's fun. It's a like a creative outlet and it goes. But damn, so like Camboy just sort of happened on accident. <laughs> yeah, it was a thing that it just like I did it as a, a joke and I even kept kept doing it as a joke. And I had the first album I like accidentally produced from just making more sketch or like funny yeah. songs or whatever it was called Straight Out of Hell. And I put that out in like 2012, like towards the end of high school. And then I made a second album, Rachie, which was named after this. Yeah. Uh, my high school English teacher had a crush on Rachel. <laughs> I remember that you <laughs> yeah. told me. Yeah. And she, like her and I are on the cover of the album. Um, and th those albums are old and I like have taken them down because they reflect, um, uh, I guess, a musical capability that I'm really like, it'd be best if no one saw yeah, <laughs> this yeah, first iteration of. Um, and then I f even feel the same a little bit about the two albums after that, White Devil and CGM. There, there, there's good stuff in there, but the unfortunate thing was like when people would search Camboy Smith, the first thing would come up would be like I love Nikki Heaton from White Devil, and I'm like, that's not how I want you to be introduced to my music here in 2023. Yeah, that's a horrible reflection of like the depth and like where it's at now. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, there's been the kind of the shaving off, and now like. The most, the oldest one that's out there on Spotify is Camrona Virus from 2020. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, so, but there was this arc of like, and there's been this entire arc from the beginning to now where it's completely this shallow character. And it's like purely an exercise of the shadow through like, okay, a lot of like hip hop can be like super violent or like misogynist. And I'm trying to like do that like extra hard, so hard that it's funny. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And also while also being bad at rapping. And there's just been this slow thing of like bringing that shallow character and then bringing more of my genuine self into it. So then you have this like half and half thing. And I feel like the art from Camrona to this most recent one with love songs has been like, okay, now the shadow's actually starting to dissolve and become a smaller part of it where, like, the genuine or, like, fully amalgamated thing where I'm actually, like, speaking from the heart and about, like, what's real for me, it's coming out more and more. And I'm now mm. finding the whole process of lyric writing and song making to really only be fulfilling and worth pursuing as long as I'm tapped into this deepening of truth mm. like you, you not using it to communicate a truth that i already know but going in with a question of like here's the low resolution thing i need to explore the truth of and then through writing and making the song and performing it and getting it made and analyzing it i then just discover a new depth of truth and self and like to me, that's become the most important thing. Yeah. Is and that's that's part of it with like, the, obviously like the root of it being like a form of like poetry writing or anything mm -hmm. like that, which is like why, like even I can come up with stuff, but like I have, 
like rhyme scheme and stuff in my head because mm-hmm. like I would I would write poetry and things like I I write I write jokes I write this and I I'd, I'd put down these things and I did them in my youth because I I liked hip hop I always liked you know whatever listening to stuff R and B and making songs and whatnot but um it's that like that process of getting it out of your head and then coming up with an idea that like means something to you that mm-hmm. feels more like poetry and then all you do is just like. Well, now, well, we're making a song, so let's just make that song. Mm-hmm. But you're still getting the root value of what, like, a poem would do for you. That's At least that's what yes. I feel like. That's what yes. I feel like it would do. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, when I went to college. I studied film and creative writing, and I, I focused on poetry. And that was yeah. something that occurred to me because, you know, when I first went into creative writing, I had to choose between fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. And I chose poetry because, to me, I felt very well-versed in fiction and story construction. I felt like I just had my voice in that. Like, I just knew what I wanted, and I didn't have a whole lot to learn from pursuing that. And I was like, poetry, I do this lyric writing, and I don't feel very poetic. I don't feel very nuanced or detail or word-focused. I feel like I need to develop that part of myself. And, and, and v- sure enough, it really wasn't until... I don't feel well, I need attention, that I really started Mm. taking the way I would operate in those poetry classes to write poems, that genuine side of like stream of consciousness or emotional extracting or sharing or, or, you know, just truth diving. Mm -hmm. That was, I don't feel well, I need attention is the album where it starts with this really raw, simplistic sort of poetic lyric writing. And then it, it starts to flower up and then the, the harder rap bars are then reintroduced but as the album progresses, the lyrics get more complex and more yeah. bar heavy Yeah. Um, by the time you get to the end. Um, so, yeah, now now it totally my process no longer feels like it's this strenuous grasping for the bars and punchlines. It now feels very nicely balanced where it's got this core of poetic truth pursuit. And then the bars and the punchlines and the funny things are more like decorative Little, little flare, charm, like flare, yeah, flare yeah, yeah, ornaments yeah, yeah. on the tree and, yeah. and whatnot. Okay, okay. Yeah. I I would actually because uh, um, obviously like hip hop's fifty years old, which is insane to think about. Yeah, like I'm like, it did hit me. I'm like, damn, we really in our like like rock and roll hall of fame era of hip hop, where it's just like Fifty Cent's doing like <laughs> revival tours, and shit, right? Which is wild. My brother went to that last week. Like, did he? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I was I was like I've been seeing a bunch of those just like those like hip hop fifty events that have been going on, and it's been dope. Um, is, are there any like, cause now like the, 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 the world around hip hop is so big. Like, are there any moments you want to see play out with the Camboy? Like, like, mm. would you, would you do like a watch the thrones? Like you accompanying somebody else mm. on like a doubles album or like a, a I, what I, a time to be alive type situation. Yeah. You know, like this, is a, like, is there, did you ever have a thought for that? Or did you ever have like, Oh, I'd love to just make a joint album with this person or band because I know you've also gone outside with music too. Yes, so I, I do like the idea of a Watch the Thrones. I don't know who I would do that with or like because yeah. I feel like it would need to be someone because like Jay Z and Kanye love were like to find had this po- nice Camboys polar opposite. I want to right, find right. Camboys evil or good alter. Ego. I don't know, like what if Camboys been good the whole time? <laughs> right, <laughs> you find somebody who's more evil. Right, but they say the nicest shit for no. Re- I don't know. That would be. Like, right. Well, it'd be wild. I, I, you know, I thought about it recently, especially with the introduction of those like AI voice things. I thought about what if I just did like a collab album with me and Drake? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's Camboy and Drake. Camboy and Drake. I mean, I thought about that, but but the, you said the band thing, and I have been thinking about this a while because a lot of the songs on "I Don't Feel Well," "I Need Attention," and a lot of the songs on "Love Songs for Absolutely No One" are less hip hop rap, and they're more like. <laughs> band music that or <clears throat> they could be retranslated very nicely mm. in a setting where I, I work with a band or a group of it has like a more like orchestral or like or just like it like mm-hmm. fundamental music instead yes. of just like your digital beats and stuff yes. like that. yeah and i feel like i'd like to amalgamate some tracks from i don't feel well and some tracks from love songs into like you know an hour-long show of live band music mm. i would love to do that and like get a nice taping of it that would be so fun yeah because i've seen your your live shows um have like a like they have a, their own little energy about it mm. which is interesting because it's yeah, like it's very I, different it's, from the recorded music it's one thing to you know obviously like be doing this and you you go in your your recording you know space and you you pump these things out but then like 
how you translate. I think it was um. I had that moment where I was like, "Yo, this dude is 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 all right." When you did the live show and you did Cool Butt, mm. and I was just like, "Oh, this dude!" Like, no, and then yeah. he had like the, the the neon suit on. I was like, "Yo, mm-hmm. this dude knows how to like." And I'll get into it too. Yeah. I like, start screaming, yeah, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, "Yo, you actually put on like a whole rap show." Like, I was like, "This is really cool," and um, I think getting to see that in like a in like a refined like composer band type thing that'd be dope. yeah that'd be kind of dope mm-hmm. yeah because i've jammed with bands before like dave demuro and steve marcinowski and uh i mean any combination of people just hanging out at baboon lasan and there's been times i've hopped up on stage with bands very briefly and and you know they played something and i spit some of my lyrics like these things have happened before and there's something that feels much more like how i was talking about there's this letting go and really getting into the music that feels more naturally the case or naturally able to get into the groove when you have other living people playing instruments yeah. around you rather than you're replaying an already made beat from a speaker. Yeah. Um, there's, there's something that just allows you to get more deeper and embodied that energy. jam. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, like seeing like those like jazz funk bands, just like mm-hmm. jam or like have a, like, and then you're in it, you're in a pocket and then you yes. start riffing and then you just like, mm-hmm. Oh shit, we made something and I didn't even know. Mm-hmm. Or, or even it's not even with the, the point of making something. We presented something to like whoever's here and, mm-hmm. and it, and it like, it did something to them. Like yeah. it, 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 it gave you um some feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What is your personal favorite song of the There's three that are out yeah. And then I guess there's two that we've kind of started on That um, aren't out You, I guess you could Oh the ones we've oh, the ones we were, uh, To be honest And I uh, I think I still have Like uh, a rough draft that you like sent me mm-hmm. In like, a, um, like an email And I'll play it every so often Is uh, it Mike and Mary? Mike and Mary Mike, Mike dude, and Mary Everyone loves Mike and Mary Mike and Mary is my shit man that was that was a fun, and that was um, obviously I, I'll do some like rapping with you, like the way we will we'll sit, we'll play the beats, and then we'll do these like, let's you know, hey, let's you know, you write some stuff. We'll just be sitting like this, chair to chair, writing some stuff, and I'll usually go for that like melodic tone. Um, and I've done some rapping stuff, but this was like the first time I got to like like really get in like some pockets, and mm-hmm. I was like, and you were like directing in this, and we're like try this, and I like, hit that, and I was like. Okay, like I like this process, and then the beat hit. And I was like, oh, this shit, kind of hard. Like I ain't no hip bars like this. Like yeah. this is wild. Like, <laughs> it's yeah. like yeah. <laughs> Dude, Mike and Mary, Dude, when Mike that hits, Mary. Yeah. it's over. Yeah, do the mic. Do the Mary. Why we do the mic? Why we do the Mary? Do the Mike and Mary with the dysentery. I do the Mike and Mary with the urinary dysentery. Fucking Sherry Berry in the elevator missionary. Mama said it's necessary that I join the military, but I'd rather do the Mike and Mary in the kitchen with an open carry. Yes, that shit is hard. Yeah, it's like yo. Yeah, and that that's so fun that we can do that because a lot of times too in collaborations it's like I can sit in the room with someone and we can bounce ideas and make notes or whatever, but eventually we're going to have to go our separate ways and I'm going to need to be by myself while I write some lyrics. Yeah. But sometimes there's moments where you and I actually manage to have an out loud bouncing off of, of ideas for lyrics, or we can just sit in the room for together for like 30 minutes quietly and then come back and like, all right, I got some stuff and you got some stuff. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's a level of, I I don't know, a level of comfort, trust and patience to be able to do that with someone. Cause I've talked about how back in high school, I was making those videos. It was very comfortable shooting with my friends during the day. And then at the end of the night, they're staying over the, they're staying the night. They're playing video games now in the same room as me. Their attention is occupied on that. Now I'm next to them on the computer editing. Yeah. And so it's like now in this adult life, a lot of this editing or strenuous writing or these things, they've become more private for me. And so it's rare. It's, it's, it's hard to find a functional way that feels good and, and right and comfortable and extracts the creativity out of people and it, with two adults in the room having to do a having lot of that to like of. like it's almost like that sharing of that energy of like even though we're doing something separate mm-hmm. we're, we're we're still in that same space where 
if the idea comes, we don't have it's not a oh shit, I gotta get them back over here. Mm-hmm. They're right around the corner and you'll let oh, what about this and let's try this out and let's mm-hmm. like mix this up. I think um you talking about like starting out doing this stuff with your friends, that was kind of my start into like creative production stuff, mm-hmm. like even getting into um because it's like my progression was more it was like, yeah, I ended up obviously like doing a focus in comedy stand up, but that wasn't like the start of it. I was, like, you know, naturally funny or whatever. I, I would do, I was big into like fun ways of self deprecation, and I would always play these like bumbling idiot characters for friends who like did their own little personal films. Um, I was always the actor. Like, I was like, yeah, I'll get in front of a camera. Why not? Right. Um, <clears throat> And then I had friends who like did like film studies in high school and then ended up going to college for film. And, and I would just always be that like, yeah, if you need an actor, you know, I got you. Um, and then being able to like hang out in those creative spaces helped me just like, oh, let's try this. Let's try this. And we got the shots that we wanted and we got to do it more. And then at the same time, I was just like doing like theater stuff. Hmm. And like so I was able to use those both together. And then. We would the concept of doing monologues became big in theater, and I would just write my own. And then it turns out I was like, "Oh, I'm writing jokes." I didn't, mm. Like I didn't intend mm. for them to always be funny, but um, they somehow would. Even how I delivered them, like I think I did like a monologue about they wanted like a mournful monologue, uh, like a sad one, and mm. I did this thing. I came up with this idea of doing like a eulogy, being asked to do a eulogy for like my estranged father, mm-hmm. and. Uh, it was supposed to be this like mournful, like, you know, like I never met this guy. I don't know who this person is, but how I delivered it, I, it kept being like dark humor as opposed to just being dark. And then that's one of those moments I was like, oh shit, I think I'm onto something here. But being able to start doing that in like a creative space with people, if I was just like contained by myself, I probably wouldn't have gotten done. And I've noticed more as I've gotten older that like, I do want that feeling. Mm. I need that like, people in the room jam sesh studio session filming a thing i'll take that energy and then i'll have enough to go to my own personal space and still do Mm -hmm. it and then when i'm in a space where i'm by myself and i don't feel very creative i'm just like oh i'm not around creative people Mm -hmm. that's the problem Mm -hmm. i am a creative person be inspired but i need that yeah i need that inspiration i need that like that creative juice to be like yo what you got? All right, cool. <laughs> and, yeah. and then we get a Mike and Mary situation. Right. Because I don't even know these motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> I barely do. <laughs> and I've seen them many times before. My, you gave I've shown me, my mom you gave the song. Me one she's, quote. Like, oh. she's like, go show them the song. And I'm you like, I don't think they'll like it. One quote about these people. Uh, I think they seem like sweet people. They, they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I might never meet them. Right. But, but just know you got a hit. In your honor, you have a, yeah, you exactly. Have a, you have uh-huh. <laughs> um, okay, so let's yeah, let's let's talk about our our video and film collaborations. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the first time we ever did it, it wasn't the first sketch we ever worked on together. That West Side thing with you and Matt White. That was the first one. Yes. You know, yeah. You guys were talking like robots and shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was that on? Shit show. That was, was on shit yeah, show. Yeah. yeah it was yeah. like the fifth episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Aaron yeah. Foley episode. Yeah. <laughs> shit show was a fun concept. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We were, um, we went right out there, uh, to Cape Fear River and mm-hmm. I just got back from Philadelphia. Yeah. And I was like jet lagged. I had, and I remember I wrote that sketch high. Like it was just like one night I was like, I remember I put this sketch together and I just smoked a bowl by myself in my apartment and got on Celtics and just just let it flow. <laughs> just like, all right, it's Cordero and Matt Rocky talking to each other and this is what they're saying. And I'm just like, You guys are just gonna talk like like fucking white robots. <laughs> 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 and yeah. And you know, I posted these sketches set when I started post, posting these sketches on their own rather than full shit show episodes and i was posting them on facebook where it would like give you that preview it was like the only one on facebook that like took off and like got a bunch of like an influx of like thousands of views and i ended up i i'm pretty sure it's the reason that my friends um or i was a my friend and, and many of his friends uh maximo this a guy from from london <laughs> that's like in like <laughs> hardcore like metal bands and shit and um 
he's a young guy and he's he's piss lord on um the <laughs> the bad boy album yeah, yeah, and so like lord. yeah we, we've had a couple of music remote music collaborations but uh yeah, it's funny. That's that's the sketch like that he discovered shit show through, and it was like kind of like we became friends, yeah, friends and fans of each other. Yeah, uh, West Side, <laughs> West Side, West Side, West Side. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you remember Damn. how I initially approached you for the five hour movie? Um. Yeah. Yes. I I remember. So, cause, um, we were just talking about this earlier about. I think you said you shot it over like a year and a half, mm-hmm. about a year, year and a half. Mm-hmm. I remember you. You were already at this point. You were already like doing shit show stuff. You had already put out several pieces of work, and like we knew that you would just invite comics to be on. Mm-hmm. And I just I remember. You were, um, you had already started shooting some things yes. with other comics, and um, I'm trying to think if I remember exactly when you approached me. I do just remember being like, "I hope I get on this joint." Like mm. I was just, I was just because I was like, "All right, he's he's planning this thing." You were telling me like you're planning this movie, and uh, and I think at that point maybe you'd already shot some stuff with like Steve, like Marcinowski, mm-hmm. like a few other. Obviously, had like Burke on there. And I was just like, all right, yeah, let me see if I can if I can do this. And all I just remember is the emphasis on like you're gonna be wearing the karate gi. Yeah, it was like the only <laughs> thing I knew was like you're gonna be a karate guy. Yeah, and you're, you're a karate man. Yeah. And yeah. I knew that there was like this general sort of like happy, like yeah. you're the only happy character in the fucking movie. Everyone else is yeah. like dead and <laughs> yeah. depressed. So there is something about being like this beacon of light. And, but there's also this element of like, like I feel like the naivety is is portrayed through like I have a yellow belt, <laughs> like I'm super strong because I'm a yellow belt. <laughs> That's tied so poorly, and it was like the <laughs> emphasis on like how bad we wanted it, like like, like tied out. Ah oh, man, yeah, I think you were just like I, I want you in the karate karate gi, and um, karate gi, karate gi, the gi, the gi. At the you, the thing that got me was like because that day or I think it was maybe it was more than a day that we shot the first day I shot and I got you know you, you gave me the um was the first the, day we shot with Jeremy Bivens in the kar- the karate studio or do that's we- the thing it was the, I think the first I feel like the first day because I just remember the studio being just like, the, <laughs> just like how do we get access to the studio and then we got the um the armless mic guy that you're supposed to beat up you know like right. the self-defense guy uh-huh. <laughs> And you're just like, I just want you to go off on this thing. Like, just, uh-huh. just like, fuck around, have fun with it. Um, Man, that was just like a, that was just a fun moment. And then I think from there, we just like went from spot to spot. Mm-hmm. Um, Dude, the scene with you, Drew Harrison and Brian Granger in the woods is so, it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie, especially the line, you, you've meditated your way into this dark world and then you start exploring the forest and you just say hope nothing bad happens to me <laughs> <laughs> the way you even like kind of like cock your head at the two to is so, yeah, yeah. hope nothing bad happens to me <laughs> <laughs> that the the chase scene um Oh, the, dude, the Steve chase was so, <laughs> so upset about that. I remember because that was kind of the time you were getting really into exercising, so you were like looking yeah. at the positives, like, "Yeah, this is hard, but like, I'm into it." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then Zach is like, eh, eh, <laughs> "Come on, come on." I like how because I think poor Steve in the it, suit though. <laughs> was it Steve who was like? Uh, I think he maybe had some opposition to running. Mm. So I mean, he was in a suit and like business but, shoes, but you. I feel I don't know maybe it was your intention but I feel like your original intention was to have us like run legitimately but then we ended up slowing down to right. this like slow little like mini chase right 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 <laughs> I was like, Yo. and you had it to where like we're just behind each other on some like uh-huh. Scooby Doo shit <laughs> and then I love like it's it's so <laughs> it doesn't feel like it belongs with most of the movie that scene, like just the energy of the music that's playing. <laughs> and also there's one shot where y'all are coming up onto the dock. Like you're leaving the street and getting up on the dock. And there's some guy that's like walking to his car <laughs> that like gets in the shot and he sees he's being filmed and he goes, 
<laughs> so it just walks to the side and y'all run past it. It's so great. Uh man. Yeah, that was um that was cool. And I was glad I got the chance to do that because um like going back to like it got me back to this space of like uh I got to be silly, goofy, but also like really feel what was happening mm. and like because obviously you were saying like the, the decisions you made in this film were very like i'm just going with a thought and i want to like mm-hmm. see this play out and um it was kind of cool to embody that because like yeah. i got something out of it too also just the idea of like being comfortable shooting this thing look at just outrageous in a, in a yellow belt <laughs> karate mm-hmm. gi, but like knowing that um, what the message and the intention was for it, it just helped me just like block out everything. And mm. I was just having fun. Like I was just like, whatever this is, I'm with it. Like we're going here, we're going there. And then we shot in the morning. Like we did those like mystic scenes with, uh, what's my guy? Ah, uh, why am I forgetting his name? The old sensei. Oh, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Kent West. Kent West, who I, I Master would, Gunis. Master Gunis. <laughs> Master Gunis. <laughs> yes. I need your teachings. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 it's funny. <laughs> this line where he's like, I brought you this sword. I've been keeping it in my fucking butt. <laughs> there may still be some poop on it. <laughs> I just feel like these are things I just told this guy. Like, I was like the first time I worked with him, too. And he's probably just like, What the hell did I get myself? That was, the, that was the thing. Uh, this process was it. Like most of the time, not every time I've done like stuff, even for you, whatever, there's always like a slight script where you're like, mm. this is what I want you to do. Uh, whether it be like working with you or anybody I've like done like films with, it was like, I want you to say this, make sure this, this line gets hit. Now, you know, I'd memorize the line, like same way we do with the music, like I start memorizing stuff. With this particular one, it was heavy, like we're here physically. Mm-hmm. We know there's an action you want us to do, mm-hmm. but almost every time you're like, do it this way, do it that way, have mm-hmm. fun with it this way, like mm-hmm. <laughs> fuck around with it. And I think yeah, you, you he had to do that butt line like <laughs> six or seven times. <laughs> yeah, and you wanted the right, even the even the happened to me, yeah. like yeah, like you got it to a point where it got there because mm-hmm. you were just like. Say it this way, say it kind of goofy. And then I did it a couple times. And then we just kept like I love yeah. that concept of like it it wasn't just the scripted thing. It was more of like, now that we're in the moment, say this line, but say it how you want, or say it like really good. Right. <laughs> really odd, right. Oddly, oddly. Um Yeah, every time I see uh every time I'm here, or like every every time, every other time, like I'll see that guy. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. It'll That's be like, funny. He'll be like out at uh like Kate for wine and beer or something. And That's like interesting. and like whether he rem- whether he remembers that exact uh like scene or whatever, mm-hmm. it was just like we do this eye lock where it's like we know each other. Yeah. So we, mm-hmm. we have some shared trauma. <laughs> 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 we were in the woods together saying some wild shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> for for a crazy man. Right. Yeah. Um so uh, what I'm always curious about this, especially for those those few people that really were worked on this movie a lot. Um, did you have you have you actually watched the whole thing, or have you just kind of like gone back to it, and like jumped around in pieces? I, I know it's fucking five hours; it's, it's yeah. a hard sit through. So I I watched it once when it came. out. I think you did put it up online mm-hmm. right, on like YouTube. Um, Can you bring the mic just a little bit closer? Oh yeah, I got you. Yeah, yeah. I I watched it all the way. Like one time, um, I it sucks. I was I was already in New York by the time you had released it. Mm. I would have loved to have watched it in the theater. Yeah, I would have loved to have for yeah. that event. Mm. I think you even like asked at one point, or like I know you gave me the date for it, and I just knew because I think I had just gotten there, mm. and I was just like, "Fuck, I can't leave." You know, like yeah, I was, yeah, I was yeah. already like I was working or something. Um, and uh, right around when you released it, I just sat and watched the whole thing, and then, uh. In 2020, I watched it again, but I did. I just like I did like skip around mm-hmm. and like get through certain like parts. But um, what did so yeah? My question yeah, was, 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 what did you think when you first watched it? Like what? How did you feel about it? And and also not just once you watched it, but maybe even before. 
I guess it would be interesting to hear what were you thinking as you were making it? Like what was going on in your head? And then like when you finally saw it, then then what did you think? So you um, you had already sort of prepped me when we were shooting that like this particular segment is not um, this particular segment of it feels very it's like a tonal shift from like certain parts of it because like you you had already told me i was like sort of like a hero character mm-hmm. and, and this um and then you as we shot more it was the idea that i'm gonna transically come to this um this place um and this world is dangerous but even me doing it it was still kind of goofy. Like it was yes. fun. Cause it's like, you know, I meet Granger and then you're like, hey, hey, we got here, boy. You know, I'm gonna get in that ass. Oh my God. Yeah. Granger's Granger. line, the way he delivered, I'm going to hold you down yeah. and fuck you and eat your poop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, he's just like oh. holding hands. <laughs> you yeah. know, he's got, that, <laughs> he's got his little laugh going. It was, <laughs> it was goofy <laughs> as shit, man. Do you remember? Do you remember we were? Do you, did you keep it in one time where uh, we were doing it on that trail? I think it's near you. Was it near UNCW? Yeah, yeah it was in the UNCW. Do you remember when somebody walked past? Yeah, I don't think I did keep that <laughs> in there. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I just know that we shot, and it was just like this moment of like, there's just like a random person running through mm-hmm. there. But I just thought that was like. Even in that moment, it just felt fun and goofy. And I think we had a riff about it. I, th- I don't think, yeah, I don't think you kept it, but I think you did record. That's just the like interaction of like a person. Oh, oh. Uh, and then it got progressively, um, I could see the concept of it being progressively darker because then at one point we were shooting in the green screen studio mm-hmm. and um, you had me with the sword and mm-hmm. I'm supposed to be fighting these demons or I was fighting something. The wolf. Mm-hmm. The wolf, yeah, I was fighting the wolf. Um, and you know, you wanted me to be serious and you did these close ups mm-hmm. and like, I, I got what you were saying. It's like, he's in this world. It's going to be darker. Um, but based on everything I'd shot before, I was just still in this like happy, chill, chill place. Like everything was still cool. Um, and then I watched the movie mm. and I see the world, um, that you had actually painted and i'd seen some clips i saw like a clip. right i think the gerard was in a clip mm-hmm. and i'd seen some and how they go together but then like that opening sequence with the waves and the darkness and everything i was like that that part felt almost transit like it was mm-hmm. just like a, it was like it felt like some uh <clears throat> some uh 2001 space odyssey type shit right you know where it just like it took me out of it for a second and then that that helped me realize i was like oh this world is like dark and then my character being there is such a contrast mm-hmm. to it like yeah this is this goofy thing and these people you know they do this stuff but um seeing it all put together like took me back so i what i did i did like that for mm-hmm. that and i like being a part of that like it's like all right i need somebody who can be this like light character <laughs> yeah and then uh ultimately do a very dark thing but also good thing, as, yeah. as I guess you've yeah. kind of felt. I, I mean, I'm still confused about really what what the what, fight with the wolf means. What exactly? And, yeah, because yeah. yeah. we've been talking about that since I, I told you a theory I have yeah, about it. Yeah. But I'm not like, oh, that's it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess I just I like that it's open in that. Like, yeah, and because it kind of it it starts Space Odyssey. It it finds some root. It lives in this weird weird world and then it almost ends space odyssey like mm. for me it was just like it kind of had this like vague like obviously stuff was um like we we hit endpoints, but there were just points where i'm like what did that mean mm. but it's okay that i don't know i feel like it's right okay right yeah, yeah yeah you can't because you can't like i can't know yeah really and the fact that you t- telling me that like mm. i have theories about it and i actually re i reevaluate yeah it reconsider I mm-hmm. yeah um I think there's like beauty and like importance in that. I don't feel like everything has to just be this like, all right, I shot this thing and it's done. Like I like that. There's just some like, Mm -hmm. I don't know what the fuck's going on right now. (laughs) I don't know what's going on Mm -hmm. right now. And I guess it's just how I'm feeling at the moment. That'll help me like interpret it, Uh, which is why I kind of wanted to see it in theaters. 
Like, yeah. like I want to see it on a big screen because watching stuff on a, on another screen, which is why like, uh, I might project it or something at some point. That'd be cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. I mean, we're coming. This will be the in November. That'll be five years since it's been screened. So I've I've thought about maybe doing like some sort of screening somewhere, yeah. like a a re five year anniversary screening or yeah. something like that. But how did you feel? watching it with people so it was interesting so we did it at thalian hall yeah yeah, in, yeah. not in the Which big was, damn, yeah so not in the big theater but the the black box upstairs so it's like that little yeah private theater that they could see like maybe like 100 people or something mm. and there was like a little over 50 people that came because it was divided into two two hour and 45 minute segments pretty much um and then there was a 30 minute intermission in between those two segments mm-hmm. so for that first two hours and 45 minutes, there was, yeah, a little over 50 people. And then I like said to everyone, I was like, hey, I understand this is a really long thing. And some of y'all probably have lives to get back to and also have seen enough of this. to know maybe you don't want to see the rest. I was like, that's fine. You can leave. And, and I would say less than half of them left, but I'd say about 20, 20 of them left. Mm-hmm. So then there's like 30 something people that finish it out with me. And... Um, well, it was really interesting to see, like you said, a lot of this movie is kind of like mesmerizing and it kind of like takes you out of it. And I always talk about too, how like music's important in this too. Yeah. And that was the other thing I was going to say that was really cool about the theater and the uninterrupted experiences. You get the booming experience around you of the soundscape of that movie. And it has, there's constantly this droning going on in the music. Uh, That undertone of Mm -hmm. like, and it's, it's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It is. Um, but the I also, I, I the like score that. makes you sick. Yeah, but I, <laughs> it does. Yeah. It's fucking like, it's, it's, it's a little like queet, like mm-hmm. it gives you like an uneasiness. Yeah. And, uh, part of me likes that. Yes. In an experience. I don't know. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I love like what I've always loved about David Lynch movies is the, co- the complication of emotional reaction he creates. Because it's never just like, oh, this scene makes me happy or this scene scares me. It's like he puts funny with disturbing and eerie and and then has something very sweet and emotional and pure, but also with like this dark underbelly. So there's just, and to me, that feels more real and like this infinite interpretability of the movie. Well, I feel like that that's more like how life is. It's it's kind of this really dense and complex interpretable thing that we're looking at. And um, there's something about this element of the, the darkness and the stomach churning, like being because I see the world that's created in this movie as this dystopian, chaotic inner world like this. It's, it's a in some ways, it's a poetic representation, a visual representation of what I felt my mental illness was that I was coming to be aware of. And it was like by seeing this product that came out of me, I'm now seeing this inside of my brain and psychology yeah. in a little bit. And yeah. it is sickening and disturbing. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Like, this is the, my processor. This is how I make things. And this is the place it's coming from. I was like, I have some some things to, to think <laughs> about. To unpack. Yeah. I, yeah, a lot to unpack here, a yeah. lot to consider and, and kind of meditate on. And but here's the beautiful thing. That I think like like you're saying the opening scene has especially a lot of stuff at the end and then just throughout there's little things where it's like you have this really messy amateur shot with a handy cam oversaturated colorful mm-hmm. dark dreary sickening thing but then you have just some random moments and random shots and random sequences and random exchanges with characters and actors that are actually very beautiful that are like really like masterfully unfolded but then it it goes right back into (laughs) it's a total mess yeah and so you have these moments where you start to get mesmerized and brought into it and you're falling for the illusion of cinema but the majority of the move movie is taking you out of it to where you have to watch this thing and be aware you're in this for five and a half hours sitting in your own body watching a thing Made by someone who might just be fucking with you, and none of this means anything. <laughs> or this is the most deeply meaningful thing that you've ever seen. Yeah, you know, and that's how I feel about it. It's like to me, I see it, and as, it's both. Yes, it's, it's, it's both. simultaneously the yeah. worst thing I've ever made, and also the best and deepest piece of art I've ever made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, I, like, 
being a part of that though was mm. just fun. Like yeah. it, was, it was it was shooting the shit with the boys, with the home yes. like making And that was the dunk. original intention. Yeah. Was looking at the last two movies like, yes, those last two movies were, were good and they were polished and they're I'm happy with them. Mm-hmm. I'm glad I made them. I need to go I need to revert back to the original thing that makes this kind of creative hanging out with friends thing a reality. That needs to be the core of this process. It needs to be loose and fun for everyone. It needs to be engaging and collaborative. And the thing I care about most is exactly as you're describing, like we're here, we're in it, have fun. Yeah. I'm going to give you some direction, like try it this way, do it doing, this way. Uh, doing the, the bullet time. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, the way that yeah. looks. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, sh- like shit like that, where it's just like, and that's like the, the meta part of like movies where it's like, you know, people, they'll sit and watch this five hour thing, whatever. But like I got to do and act out some sequences I probably never, ever would have with mm. people who like I just like, oh, I never got the chance to work with this person mm-hmm. on this platform and in this way. And it turned out the way it did, regardless of whether it was handy cam done or whatever, like the intention behind it is still like pure. And I'm like. Mm. Fuck yeah, this like this ride, so people should see it. Like, yeah, <laughs> should rock out with it. Um, what was your weirdest uh, like criti- like what it, what was the weirdest comment you got about it? From did anybody like say anything about it after? Did like they tweet about it or? No, <laughs> you know, and I got like because it's it's rare that someone says something genuinely negative to me in like a confrontational way. So <laughs> I didn't get anything that. I mean, the, the most obviously the most common critique, which I knew as the thing was unfolding and going in and realizing, Oh, this is going to be, I went in thinking the thing was going to be like three hours, maybe three and a half. Mm -hmm. But then as it kept going, I was like, no, okay, it's five, it's five hours and 20 minutes. And the most common criticism is, did this really have to be this long? And I, when I, I can't say it in just a couple sentences to get people to get it. But a lot of the purpose of it, like I was talking about the uncomfortable experience of like knowing you're in your body, having to be self-aware while you're watching the movie. It's a major part of the experience. Mm. And a lot of the unpolished nature of it is a part of like the heart of it. It's part of what needed to be in my face and realized as the person making it and then analyzing this thing I made. And it, it has gotten me to think more deeply about my general philosophy that is pretty anti-revisionist. It's pretty anti-polished. It's anti-professional. It's very centered around what do I want to make? What is something that would not get made if no, like if it's not me doing it, you are a stone turner. Mm. That's your like, and that's what, (laughs) that's what like can sometimes polarize a person Mm -hmm. where it's just like, but it's also, I as a creative, I like it. Yeah. Because it's, I like the idea. It's like, no, nah, fuck. Like they say, don't turn that stone. Fuck it, I'm going to turn that stone. Like I right. need to know, like you, we were talking earlier, like what is the why? Like I, I kind of get that headspace. And I yeah. think that that's something that you you live in perpetually. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's a big like, no, I want to keep turning this thing. And like, even if it is uncomfortable, fuck it. Like, right. Kind of, that that for some reason gets to like a higher meaning for you. Mm-hmm. And um. So like it makes sense, but like, right? Why wouldn't you make this thing that's so great and uncomfortable that I want you? I need you to experience it too, because that's right. kind of what it is, right? Yeah. And and this is I feel like a, not the greatest analogy, but I was thinking like, you know, getting a thirty minute massage or even a ninety minute massage would feel very different from the experience of getting a five hour massage. Yeah. You know, and, like, and that's what I mean by there's something inherent about the experience like there's a bunch that i don't know about why it needed to be five hours and 20 minutes i mean and and here's here's the thing that i i didn't realize until maybe a year after the movie was finished and it had that five hour and 20 minute runtime i didn't realize i was born at 520 there's there's random like synchronicities that are, are are connect with a lot like i was explaining something to you earlier that there's just random synchronicities that this movie has connected with things that had already happened in my life before I made it. And then things that have happened in my life since then. Um, and you know, you can look at it as like, well, it's just cause I pay attention to this movie and I can find and connect things at random in my life like that. But 
Um, I don't know. To me, the most important thing was it was almost like this necessary portal I had to go through where I had to let go of any care about how well this does and how well anyone else likes it. But it's about the way that the making of this and then the analyzing it and my motivations later are really going to help me understand and deepen my relationship with creativity itself. And I feel like that has absolutely been the case. Yeah. Um, I mean, this shit hit theaters, so which is what like the fact a you, theater, a, a theater, but it hit a theater. Yeah, it like th- like I remember, <laughs> I remember, uh, chill. I I think I remember, um, when you posted about the screening, and I think at that time, um, because I was already in New York, I think Gerard just got there. Mm-hmm. Or he was like he was planning to go, or he was leaving, or like we were talking, and I remember like, <laughs> he's like I remember um, showing him that link. He's like, get the fuck out of here! <laughs> it's out of fucking camera. Get Daily Hall. I was like, that's a fucking move. Like regardless, mm-hmm. you got a movie played at a spot. Like I just thought that was like really cool. So like, yeah. critique all you want, say whatever. It's like nigga, it hit it hit things. <laughs> <laughs> like I got I got box office tickets. Like what the fuck yeah. you want from me? Like yeah. that's pretty. I, that's a to me. That's like a shelve it as something moment. Yes, yeah, I definitely. It wasn't just shot at the local coffee shop on a projector. Like you people sat in a theater mm-hmm. to watch this fucking thing. So like, yeah, ate popcorn, drank ate, wine, ate, <laughs> smoked vape pens. Yes. And uh, his, he's like, I remember him going on a rant about. It. He's like, this motherfucker got it in a historical yeah. downtown theater, city hall, city <laughs> hall. He got <laughs> at city hall. And we like riffed on that for like a solid minute. It was just like a funny thing. Like, damn, Cameron actually did some shit. That's a wild boy. That's a wild, yeah, that's a yeah. wild boy. Uh, yeah. Well, we can talk about <clears throat> a little bit, maybe kind of the direction of our conversation yesterday. Okay. What, what time? How long have we been going? Oh no, I'm good. I just okay. uh, I'm, it's like I had a little buzz, but I'm good. Cool. All right. Well, something I guess I can mention. I'm a Christian now, guys. That yo, <laughs> yo, for yo, I again, with you, I don't know. It's not that you you do bits cuz mm. you're not like a bitty guy. Like you you're very I serious. do in a way. In I a do, way. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's like a <laughs> Well, it's a bit. It's sometimes it's like people can't tell if the thing I'm revealing about my personality is me doing a bit yeah. or it's me being genuine. And something I've just learned about this sort of sarcastic satirical sense of humor that's kind of like the core of my sense of humor is that especially when we start talking about this coincidence of opposites, it's like I can think a horrible thing and a moral thing at the same time. So it's like sometimes this, the sarcastic portrayal of like a horrible shadow side of human being, it's not that, Oh, this is just so untrue. And I'm actually like a really good guy. It's like, no, no, no. It's just that I'm, I'm a complex person that holds both understands one is good and the other's bad. So I can say the bad one in a facetious way where it's like, we can laugh at it. Like recognize this is an immoral yeah. thing to, to to think yeah yeah or say or and, and to say in this way so lightheartedly and and I, and I think I think for you, uh, not yet has there been like this like show space or thing that you can facilitate that in so you do it in everyday life and sometimes people they're just like wait what the fuck what mm-hmm. the fuck is wrong with camera what's he saying I'm like. Nah, this dude's like he's tapped into something right now, and <laughs> he's like something. he's tapped into something right now, and he's having fun with shit. And like I'll I'll see it obviously in like your stand up format. Um, and while it goes to like certain extremes, I just like at its core, I always have gotten it, and like I get it. Mm. Like, oh, but but then yes, yeah, but then sometimes it's like, is this is this a a bit like? Opening up the door yesterday and seeing you in a Jesus piece, right? And, just being like, and then you said, oh, "I'm a man of Christ now," uh, which you've said to me like seven right. times right. before because you've done albums about it. Uh-huh. Done, you know, dude, it's only funny. fans. Jesus only yes, fans. Yes, looking back at some of the lyrics, it's like, and and you know, like I have kind of been doing. I've almost been jokingly saying I'm a Christian or saying Christian things for the past several years. But not in like this disparaging way where I'm like, I'm definitely not that. There is, there always has, not always, but 
in all those years of even facetiously doing there has been this understanding of like, look, even the people that like claim to be atheistic and say that there's no God and that Christianity is dumb or anything like that. Like if you're living in America in the Western society, you are operating on a Judeo Christian ethos way more than you're aware of. Yeah. Like it is literally the, the, the ethos that is in the Bible and both the new Testament and the old Testament, the amalgamation of these things, it is embedded into the culture and society and the family that you grew up in. Even if they're like, that stuff is bullshit. It's like, no, no, no. This is like your, your innate sense of what is right and wrong because it's not that the Bible was written and then we started behaving that way. It was that we started behave. We've always behaved this way we've developed this behavior and the Bible is us writing that behavior down in a form mm. for the first time. So like now we human have behavior manual. Type, yes. Or just like yes. observation. And it's an abstract sort of behavior manual where yeah. it's like, it's more, it's a literary um, story. It's, it's, it's got these behaviors and values embedded in them for the most part. And then there's some explicit ones in yeah. there, you know, when well, you and you're like through this like oral tradition sense. And it's mm-hmm. like, it came down this, this long and every story, not every story, but certain stories or whatever it is can hit you in like a core way. And right. Like, Oh, so this is something about like human, uh, hardwiring. Yes. That's like in there. Yeah. yeah. So something I've been thinking about with this line of like me being sarcastic in terms of saying things like, you know, I love you all go with Christ or <laughs> my brother in Christ yeah, or, yeah. you know, Oh, when I, what I was saying was like, so looking back at some of my lyrics, even when I was just like totally not into it, it was like, man, I am saying Jesus and God. And I'm talking about these things anyway, without like consciously feeling that closer, uh, attentive towards these things in the way I am now. Uh, but the, the, the line with the sarcasm thing was like, sometimes my sarcastic tone is not necessarily about how I feel about a thing. Sometimes it's more about an awareness I have of how others feel about it. Mm. You know, like it would be really uncomfortable for this person if I sincerely went up to them and I said, may Jesus be with you. <laughs> Where if I do, if I do that, like how I did yesterday where I got, I got in Zach's face or whatever. And I was just like, I will never behave immorally because he is always watching me. (laughs) You know, (laughs) and it was just like, it was done this way where like, I am sincere, but also understand how silly this sounds to the two others that are around me, especially coming from me. And so uh, there is like this, uh, to me, I feel like it's, it's an aspect of humility where it's like, by all means, let's laugh about me and, and what may be genuine yeah yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah 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 i i want to know what your process for um coming to this realization was was it through you writing music or is it just like uh was it just like i got high and i realized that god is in this in this <laughs> <laughs> that was it i smoked one joint yeah and i was like oh god's real you smoked one weed. One weed, please. I smoked one weed. <laughs> one weed, please. Uh, I need to see. I need to see God. Well, I mean, I would say the process has just been the amalgamation of everything that's happened to me in my life, and this way of looking at it, like, I don't see this awakening and enlightenment as things that I consciously willed into being. To me, this largely has to do with the. If you want to look at life as there's you and there's everything outside of you or another way, there is what seems to be you and you identify with and is really the borders of your free will and conscious control. And then there's everything that's not that. And you think about the relationship between these two fundamental pieces of reality for you, you and the other, you're constantly in a flowing creative collaboration with these things. And I think so you could, I could definitely make the case that me being so obsessed and deep into just creativity, personal making art and pieces or whatever, as nihilistic and closed minded about that process as I may have been and secular with my rhetoric as I may have been for most of my life. There was just a slow realization and reframing 
of that process, which got me to understand how divine creativity itself is and how like synonymous it is with this whole idea of there being a creator being and a creative force that is inherent and inside of everything. Yeah. And, um, I think we like, we, we take that out of, um, we, we put on a different meaning when we think like when people were having religion say like the creator. And then mm-hmm. we always think about these like, physical forms of mm-hmm. he made us in his image or this thing or this thing is it's always these like physical things but it's like what about creating just a thought or like create the creator of that particular thing so you're saying like the idea that those ideas did come from something mm-hmm. something higher is yeah. like to be respected essentially? yes and okay. i think it's a matter of getting down to what is it exactly that we have control over and i, I think that's it is like prior to 2017 right when i started making this five hour movie right before I had this awakening, I would say that my view was very mechanistic and scientific. And it was like, it was, the world was dead. It wasn't mysterious. We've pretty much figured most of it out through science. And if there's anything I want to know about, I can just look it up or I I get it, you know? And I know that there's things I don't know or just don't care about whatever, but otherwise I'm just a guy in a flesh body. And I like to make art and cause havoc and joke around. Like that's kind of, that's the extent of me. And that's like, sort of just, it feels flat. Right. Right. Yeah. And then the awakening is more like if the word consciousness came into my field of attention and it's, and when I looked at it through that same lens of, okay, let's look into the scientific perspective on consciousness since that's the way I analyze the world. You know, that's my source of truth. And then I realized, Oh, science can't figure this one out. And it's like, fundamental in fact consciousness is the thing which we engage in something like science and then you just and i think that was the essence of the awakening is waking up to seeing the wall of your own human limitation and limited consciousness and ability to understand and get it and then you see all these human creations which would be things like philosophy and science and religion itself to the degree that we have played a creative role in making text and books, carrying out tradition, having conversations about these things. And um, so back to this whole, like, there's you and your limited free will, the walls and container of that. And then there's everything else. And it's recognizing you're in a constant creative collaboration with that. And that the thing that's outside of what you identify as you is way bigger and like way more powerful and plays a way bigger role than you in what your life ends up being and who you end up being. Mm-hmm. And this question of like where thoughts come from, well, it's like, I never questioned that. But I was like, of course it's my thought. I'm making them up. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking it's like, am I like the, well, I, I've been, and I've, been, <laughs> I've, I've seen people toss out that theory of like, was every idea has already been made. Mm-hmm. It just has to like, pass through you so mm-hmm. like the idea of you know a coffee phone it's it's there it's out there. like the any infinite idea has already been made and the universe has it or what whatever space has it mm-hmm. and then somehow it'll pass through a form and like it would be through you so like oh i made this piece of art mm-hmm. but it was already there and it just like it had to come so it's like I, I can't remember what the theory was but it was like idea permanency or so, something mm-hmm. in that idea where it's like these things are actually tangible and you can pluck them yes essentially yeah, yeah yeah or or they can or you can tune into them or something like yes yeah yeah and I, I i honestly feel that the extent of of our free will and the the role we have in this creative collaboration and and here's and here's the thing of the the moment that happened to me a month and a half ago is i finally decided to stop referring to this infinite void of complexity that's beyond me i finally decided to go oh it's a good idea to call that God and to see this as a personified entity. It mm-hmm. makes everything more fun. It's a way more fun story. The world becomes alive. Um, you start to one value yourself in a very profound way. And, and in that same way, you start to see the value in every other single human being and not just in human beings, but in every piece of nature. And like, even even the more like synthetic and industrial things like the human creations, even like the things that we think we maybe are fucked up and antithetical and killing nature. It's like, to me, I see the beauty in that. And I see the beauty in in the nature that we're in as well. Um, 
it's just that there's there is beauty and love and creativity to be found in everything and then and i think that's what the will the choice we have in the free will it's not the thoughts the intuitions the images and imagination and the, the forces they're not things that we will into being they're things that we give our attention to and we have a choice on what we continue paying attention to and what we act on and engage with consciously mm. that's it but in terms of like what's coming up we don't control that yeah we just control how we engage yeah with it and respond to like it once it hits that the, you talk about the, that human limitation. And how open limits. we are to it. That's a big part of it. Yeah. yeah. Like, well, and this, you, you're saying there's like, there's this human limitation lens. There's this like perspective we can't see past. But that doesn't mean that there's not shit swimming around out there. Just like, at least in my head, I see it as like things swimming around in there. Mm. And then we can't do anything with it until it passes through our veil whatever that is mm -hmm. uh and we, you, we talked yesterday we're like and sometimes that's that's an open thing and then sometimes it's like a resistance thing and you just you, but the fact is it has its own it has its own space it is very real and that to you is god and i and i like that concept um and then the idea that as a base because mm -hmm. these and i also want to be really clear about that yeah. to me it's I, it's not that that is the totality of God because that's we can never get our heads around what the totality of right. God is. It's that we can point to these things or the idea that you you want you would like to refer to that as God. Right. And these these various traditions because you, you you we talked and you said like it's not just like obviously like I'm, I'm choosing Christianity, but there's, you know, Judaism, there's Muslim, there's all these things. If you pick this like conduit essentially mm -hmm. to personify like it helps in some way. Yes. And, and I, and I, I like that. And while I've, I've, we talked about spectrum and stuff, I'm a very like middle, like I can't believe there's nothing. Mm. And then I also can't turn like just a blind eye to the way, like just certain organized religions just operate all of them. Not everybody is doing some stuff. That's like, Hey man, like, I don't think this is the root of what, <laughs> what this stuff's mm. supposed to be. And, um, and I feel like I need to comment on it or I feel like I need to, feel some type of way about mm. it. Um, your concept of you can do both while being in it or like you can do both. And that is interesting to me. Like yeah. I like thinking about it that way. It's like, yeah, it's, that's, I, I don't know. I, I've been wrapping my right, like my brain around that for the mm -hmm. last like day or so. I'm like, okay, I, yeah. I kind of see what you're going with. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and another thing too, cause this was the, I think the growing pain that I got as may as amazing and beautiful as that awakening moment was and like my life, how it's unfolded and developed over the past six years since then. The 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 downside of it, of being in this sort of place, how I talked about the, the tree analogy, where like, let's see the major religions, you're in this forest, there's all these big, there's like five or six big trees. Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. the western trees and the eastern yeah. trees. And a lot are of the they spiritual they, types, they want to <laughs> hug all the trees for a each, little bit. Is each tree wearing its respective garbs? Yeah, yes. uh -huh. yeah, <laughs> There's yeah. a little Pope tree, there's a little Catholic tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. The, yeah. the agnostic people and, and even like the spiritual but not religious people, they, they want to stand in the forest and be able to hug each tree a little bit, kind of at their preference, and maybe hug no trees for a little bit and just stand and look at them. But there is something about... If you pick one main tree to hug most of the time, the longer you hug it, the more if, of its wisdom starts to come out and you absorb more of it. And to me, I feel that the thing that was growing was in this openness, in this space of just kind of pure consciousness and absorbing information, it was like my worldview and my meta story, the way the lens I was looking through reality became way more complicated than I could handle. And I didn't have one canonical source of wisdom that was shaping it or that it could shape itself around. Mm. And to me, I think it made a lot of like, I, I would get in bouts where I was just creative and just, <laughs> just shoot out of me. But then a lot of this in between time, it really felt like this spiritual dissonance or like split between having one foot still in nihilism. Like it really could be anything and I could be wrong and whatever. And then this other like open to what is out there, but not picking or focusing on a single canonical 
thing that's outside of me and really ultimately relying on my ability to make decisions. And I think that that I see decision making as this fundamental function that we have that's at the center of our free will. That is our, our fundamental function of engagement in creativity. And I, I saw myself having a harder time making decisions because I was holding so many different conflicting ideas that intuitive, non rational or, or just like hard thinking was the only way I could get out of it and make a decision. And that just felt wrong to me at a certain point where now the, the shift that I've described to you that's occurred, it feels like now decision-making is becoming, ha, has returned back to it being this very natural mm. thing. It's not that I don't think about things or, or ever struggle or take my time with the decision. It's just whether it's a decision I can make right now and the decision that is made that just happens for the most part. But then when a decision that is very complicated and presents itself, no, this one needs to be thought about. I just know that that's the case. And I trust I'm I'm trusting the process as a whole now more rather than catching these glimpses into that feeling of being able to trust the process. Does that does that make sense? No. Yeah, I, I just I think. Because you were talk, you were talking about how you just set up a, a base, like you said. That, like it's funny because, like I just I've been playing a lot of video games now, so I'm like, uh, I like the idea of you called it like the god slot, mm. essentially. Yeah, yeah, the god value, the god the value, the top of the, the pyramid, god, the god value at the top. Which to me, that's just like some shit from, um, like I'm playing like Witcher or something. It's like a skill tree where it's like you set your base and then every how you live your life then sort of follows from that. Um, as a concept, I really get it. Like I understand it, and and I and it's one thing that puts me in that like agnostic, like middle ground. Mm. Is like just seeing what people do when mm -hmm. they just muddy stuff up, and I'm like, man, this is such good teachings. This is a good thing, and I like this value in the higher thing. And then people just like, why are you being dumb? Like, <laughs> why, why, you, why, why are we at this point where it's like it's taking somebody's life, and um. And the idea of like entering that space and like trying to better from within is really cool. But honestly, even on a personal level, like looking outside of it, I do find myself being um, like distracted or detached as a creative, specifically mm -hmm. as a creative. I just I want to do these things. I want to do this. I want to do everything. And I always figured I was like, well, if I can get, you know, if I can get on, let me get famous real quick. They'll give me the studios. They'll give me mm. the time and I'll create these ideas. I'll be these, you know, everything people that you see mm. out there in like, you know, in entertainment. Um, I also, when you said like the God slot value thing, well, like for me, that value was like, oh, well, I need to make it like I need to go. I need to make it. So that's my high value. So that way I can fulfill these things and do all the stuff I said I want to do. Um, what you're, what I'm, what I'm taking from your concept mm -hmm. is now it's like you, you can do that within yourself with this sort of like higher slot. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like, it's maybe this isn't something you should rely on your own personal creativity to right. create. This like is it's something not that you, you should actually it. probably connect to like the, the, the infinitely shared creativity we all have. And that's why it makes sense to maybe look at something that has been around for a long time and the amalgamation and creation of it itself is something that was not a single human ego's construction of. Yeah, it was like this, these books and texts and scriptures and things were written over such a long period mm -hmm. of time and shared and kept. Mm -hmm. And we felt like we needed to keep them. Yeah, they weren't written with this intention of how are we going to manipulate the masses? It was not like a dark group of people that got around. And, yeah. kind of like, and even in those changes, like we were talking about how like, well, it's been picked up and the Kings you know, would do the, shit the, with the King the James thing. version, you yeah, know, it's like, yeah. well, but we do have access to all the translations yeah. prior and we can see where things are changed and what was changed. And also like uh, think about someone trying to do that in the modern day, like, President Biden's going to, to <laughs> revise revise the Bible. He's going to add some stuff. It's That'd like, be fire, yo! If he brings back old editions, like like. <laughs> well, I think that's the, the thing is there, president, yo. Like we got Bible, we're we're running on Bible Vista right. now, like, right? <laughs> like we're gonna, right. Like, but but there would have. 
how would he get away with doing something that the people that love the Bible and, and honor and worship it are going to be okay with and even honor? And you're not going to have all this text and response around it saying like what he did. We don't honor that. We're still on the King James version. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like that through every point in history. It's like we get a, we get a Apple, Apple right, Android right, version to, of the Bible. Right. There's a way to look at it. It's like, well, King <laughs> James was one guy and he just did what he wanted with the Bible. But then there's another way to look at it. Where it's like, no, God was at work in one. The reason why James ended up being a king at all was all creative happenstance outside of this single ego's mm. choosing and for him to even be in that position and to be inspired to do exactly what he did with so it's like and it's not to say what he did is is the most recent thing and it's the right thing like you it, it's smart to take things into context like okay this is what he changed now consider what the original thing was and what was changed and the speculation around what these changes mean and and the bigger fact that you said that it's just it people still come back to like it's yeah. not a like I, I know in our age we like we're a little bit more critical on stuff and like mm-hmm. like just as as a people because it's more and more modern and we, mm-hmm. we we pick at stuff but then like you you hit me with something and you were just talking about instead of the uh, instead of focusing on the that they did it, it's the why they did it. Yeah, and I was yeah, just yeah. Like, Damn, like, why did they, why did yeah. these old dusty dudes and scholars just why did they like feel like this needed to happen? You mm-hmm. know, um, and like you know form these rules, guidelines, whatever it is, and all of them do it separately, mm-hmm. and then like figure out a way for them to all be together because there were like points in history where they kind of were mingling mm-hmm. and like we weren't upset at this person for that religion or this that it was just kind of like a well this is my belief and it helps me find my inner peace or like creativity which is like i value my inner creativity like i want it to be i want to be able to make the things and do the things and and um like get the things done that like oh man this is really cool like i would like to see this through um and i like your idea that like this could help that in some way yes yeah like yeah. that's something that I'm like, all right, I might entertain that that idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'd, yeah, I'd be interested to see. <laughs> You're not converting me, <laughs> yeah, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not. I'm not. No, I, that's not my goal. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get baptized tomorrow. But <laughs> fuck. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well. Yeah, get that fucking get that get that this little whole podcast was a waste. Get that pool <laughs> out of that room. Get rid of it. I'm not. Get take the bath toys out. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was gonna baptize you in the clawfoot tub. <laughs> <laughs> but no um but my fault you were on a point just before right were you i think i pretty much wrapped it i mean the other thing i i want to say because and it was a point i I made towards the end of our conversations i think because because it seems like the direction i'm going is uh, i'm becoming a dogmatic religious person but you know that's not the case no no, no, there's this kind of qualifier where it's like there's a message I feel like I have for four groups of people, you know, like I, I have something I want to say to the purely atheistic. I have something I want to say to the agnostic slash spiritual. I have something I want to say to the passive religious people. And then I have something I want to say to the dogmatic religious people. And, and that dogmatic religious group is like to to acknowledge and respect the dogmatism. It's to say, hey. To be dogmatic about your religion serves utility. It is functional. It's what it's what. It's the reason you have the depth and close relationship you have with your faith and why it's so embodied in you and then why your life is so harmoniously arranged around this this thing that is bigger than you. That's why I respect it. But the thing I want to give you is I want you to be able to take that same respect I have for you and be able to apply it to those who think differently from you. So like understand the functionality of your dogma, but have a detachment from it to the degree to where you can humor other ideas or at least allow and make space for other ideas from other people. You said that, uh, that the idea of humility being taught in religion is only partially the thing you said humor is actually the thing. Mm. I like that I like that statement where it was like you say you say it's humility but it's like humor like the funny part about or like just like that that innate like I will entertain this and it's okay and it's and it's respectful and it's all fun kind of in a, in, yeah. in a sense yeah 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 I mean because it's kind of like the humility is one is the first part is understanding your limitation but like the nihilistic or pessimistic thing to do is like well, I'm limited, so I'm stupid, so I can't do anything. It's like, no, 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 no. 
First, you have the humility, understand your limitation, accept your flaws, all that. And then despite that, you go out and you humor the world. You, you play anyway, even though you're flawed, even though you're going to make mistakes, even though you're dumb. Like you're going to say stupid shit. You're going to say the wrong things. You're going to say things you're going to disagree with tomorrow yeah, yeah. <laughs> or several years from now heavily. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, and I think that was really a major feature is realizing how deeply anti-spiritual my anti-social developments over time have become like I was talking like I'm kind of coming out of this anti-social tendency I've had a lot of like the podcasting that I've done up to this point and watching them back and analyzing myself is realizing I'm awkward in conversation because I'm not here I'm not <laughs> yeah. I'm not seeing this as a, a live and amazing you thing you are on I've always told people and I was like because <clears throat> like I've known you for a very long time and I know like everybody's got opinions about everybody. Yeah, that's just, that's just the way we are in life. And my thing, I've always been at a base level. It's like, yo, Cameron is just thinking on a, like he's just <laughs> on a, he is, he is on a channel that most of y'all don't know. And it's like, it's not even a channel I'm on. I'm on my own channel. Yeah. And we've talked about this where I was just like, I've just been able to tether on what he's on. I'm like, yo, yeah. Like I, I, <laughs> Like these people don't even know what's happening right, right now. Right. Like this is just a whole other thing. So it's like you gotta understand. Like he just thinks different. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, you gotta. And it's like I, because I think different. I think I've always just been able to like mm -hmm. tap, tap into that. And I'm like, okay, got you, mm -hmm. got you. Um, and you feel like you, you see that you feel like you're awkward in these. Uh, well, no, I think it was just like like. You know, I think what makes a good podcast host and someone who's just good in conversation is they ask good questions. They're genuinely engaged. They're genuinely curious. And so it was like the spiritual awakening got me genuinely curious about a particular set of aspects of this reality. And the enlightenment kind of filled in the rest. And, and I think the social element of that is really what kind of like I realized from watching this podcast, like, man, some people I'm just really not. When the conversation's good, it's because the person I'm talking to is really a great conversationalist, mm. and it's not me. And when I'm with someone that's awkward like me, then we have an awkward <laughs> conversation. But it's like, no, I want, I, how can I genuinely become someone who's good at conversation? Well, it's like, I got to let go of just wanting to act out that reality. It's There's something in me that's going wrong. That's causing this problem that is making me antisocial that is making me not socially present or interested or curious yeah. that is uh, and this is this sin of pride of being caved inward on oneself and not the beauty of the world outside of you and looking at this massively more intelligent creative partner you perpetually have that is God. And I, I think that is, is acknowledging God and seeing God and seeing the world is alive. Well, now it's just every little piece that I'm looking at on a moment to moment basis is alive and infinitely interesting. And now I'm there, mm. you know, like, I feel like I don't know how this podcast will seem to others, but I feel I am way better at socializing now suddenly and it's not that I've never had this ability. Yeah. It comes out randomly. But now but it's it feels like a little now, more default. Now yeah, now instead of it instead of it coming out randomly, then you noticing it, it's more of like a now that I've noticed it so many times, I can like not just like replicate it for like a fake reason, mm. but like, no, let me like actually put this in my like my hardwire. You were saying that shit, um, Ah, you were like, you hit me with a bar um, yesterday. You're like, people, like the idea of like picking a religion uh, is better in the God slot than um, just one ideology. Because you were like, that's like running. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, like yeah. running up. That's like living off a program instead of software. It's like, what yeah, is okay. software. Instead, what's that shit? Hey, yeah. Oh, I, I remember the exact yeah. analogy. So it was like trying to pick a single person's philosophy. Uh, and put that in a God slot as opposed to a religion is like trying to run your entire computer on a single software rather than an operating system. Mm. It's like, no, 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 the religion's the operating system. You need that, and then you can overlay 
single man philosophies on top of that all day. Because mm. um, that's the thing is is there's so much great philosophy out there. It's just not the same level of depth and robustness, nor creative. And that's the big thing. The creative process, which led to the birth of the major religions, is something way more complex than the normal creative process of a single human being writing a book. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> In there, <laughs> um, but I mean, and, and philosophy. But see, here's the here's the catch twenty two is a philosophy kind of like creativity theory, like I'm like laying out is yeah. it can help you perhaps see that which I'm describing. It can help bring someone to see that relationship. Like a philosophy can help you see th- these are operating systems yeah. and that this is a software. So it's like. This philosophy is best going to be used if you go get an operating system yeah. to it overlay this with. It won't work on everybody. Yeah, I know that. And and that. And also, I don't want it to get across that I'm I'm trying to evangelize yeah. here, especially not to a particular. No, religion. no I, I don't even mean it that even yeah. in that way. Just like that idea within creativity theory, because I I even realized that like 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 I said, you're on your own frequency. I'm on my own frequency, and people don't even get my frequency. Like mm. people mm-hmm. just like. Just the idea of you being a creative and the idea of like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go tell jokes. I'm going to try it. I'm going to attempt to tell jokes for a living or mm-hmm. or be this person, this artist. And then people, some people cheer you on, but they're still in their head just like, that's fucking weird. That's weird. You want to do that with your life? That sounds dangerous. That doesn't sound safe. I'm going to go chill at Buffalo Wild Wing. You know, like it's like, like they just want to be in this like this this headspace. So like. I know that like an idea is like grandly proposed as creativity theory. It'll take a while to hit some people mm. because it they can barely stomach the idea of like going to an open mic. <laughs> right. So, so uh, but I just, I like it though. Like I, I get it. I, I mm. like the idea of it. Um, but yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Well, do you have anything else that you... Want to talk about or or plug before we go? Uh, Black Power where Rangers. Where we at? What do we hit? What do we hit? We do, do we good? Do we do good time? We do good time, don't we? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. This is a meaty conversation. Meaty conversation. Meaty combos, yeah. Dude, I had a good time talking with you yeah. as usual, and yeah. Um. Well, I'm looking forward to hanging with you and probably working yeah. Well, on we some we still got we got some music we can probably get done. Um. Uh. Yeah, man. That Mike and Mary. The Mike and Mary. That Mike and Mary joint. That Mike and Mary <laughs> joint, though. Uh. Honestly, I mean, I don't, you know, obviously I don't know when exactly this will be out, but right now we're on tour for the Black Power Rangers uh, comedy tour. Um, that's this is the second year we've done it, and um, Will's uh, the orchestrator, Will's Maxwell. Uh, he's definitely planning to do more. So just like go to Black Power Rangers comedy on the stuff because like he's probably gonna want to do more throughout the years, and the, the tours will get bigger. Um, we're hoping for that. Um, I have my own podcast, Negro Jump. Um, you you can you can type this in. You're not gonna get in any trouble. Uh, you it's, put on a yeah. list, <laughs> uh, and it's it's just me and my buddy co-host. We're uh, two black nerds. We talk about like anime, Japanese culture, black culture, and then how like all that just sort of like comes together. Um, and uh, I just I do comedy. You know, when I can in New York, I do my own production when I can. I'm just chill. I'm trying to chill, create. Like, that's literally it. Like, I want to, like, make shit. Like, yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. And now through my um, my uh, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, I'll be able <laughs> to reach my true potential. Now, now that I have gotten him to cross the fence and will soon baptize him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm serious. There's a pool over there. There's yeah. a there's a pool. There's a pool right an over infinity there. Infinity pool. An, infin- <laughs> an infinity pool. <laughs> oh man. Well, I appreciate you, brother. Appreciate and, you, uh, man. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's bring it in. Was, was really Were those good. the two orbs? <laughs> yeah, those are the two. <laughs>